title for my talk this morning is called Effective Community or Maintaining Effective Community. Uh, in these times, more than ever, we need to be working hard at maintaining effective community. Although we've got physical distancing between us, uh, a hallmark of the Christian life is that we are part of a vibrant and loving community. And I believe it's our commitment to this aspect of community uh, that is a key to providing ongoing gospel opportunities in these days. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. Read with me if you can. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone, if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and spiritual songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, I pray you'll speak to our souls as we, t as we learn from your word this morning and expand our horizons so that we can be effective as your children, even during this time. Amen. One thing I've noticed is I like to cook. Uh, I like to be in the kitchen, I like to do uh, the meals and the cooking, but I've noticed there's two types of, of chef, if you like, or two types of, of uh, people who, who make food. Um, I, I call it the scientist and the creative. The creative is someone who just likes to look in the cupboards, see what ingredients, ingredients they are, and just kind of throw them together. And if they're really good, they come up with an amazing meal almost out of nothing. Whereas I'm the scientist. I want to measure everything. I want, the, I want the recipe. I want to measure everything out. And that helps guarantee uh, the outcome. Later today, I'm going to make some banana bread, uh, bake some banana bread. And I will measure everything and make sure all the ingredients are put in so that I can be sure that what comes out tastes uh, like I want it to taste like. I don't know if you're a creative or you're a scientist. Uh, I'm not judging you, uh, but hopefully uh, you enjoy good food. It's important at these times. Well, what I believe Paul gives us here is the ingredients for effective community. I believe that when you're in the kitchen, putting the right things in, in the right way, means you get the right stuff out at the end of the day. And it's the same for Christian community. For effective community, we need, we need to have the right ingredients. We need to put the right things in the mix in order that we can have the right stuff come out that pleases and glorifies Jesus. So there are seven ingredients here. I'm going to pass over some of them quite quickly. Others I'll delve, delve into a little bit more deeply. But seven ingredients for effective community. The first one is this. The first is to understand that we are chosen. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, in Colossians 3 verse 12. We are God's chosen people. We are holy and dearly loved. In order to uh, have great effective community with one another, we need to understand our identity. And here Paul tells us our identity is twofold. Firstly, there's an individual identity. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, uh, verse 17, sorry, Paul tells us the old has gone, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. When we became a Christian, uh, there was a total, uh, it wasn't just a makeover. It wasn't just like going on one of those makeover shows that made you look pretty or more handsome for a day. What God did was a total takeover of your life. It was a complete transformation of who you are from the inside out. You are a God's chosen people. You are holy and dearly loved. You have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a critical building block for us if we are to have effective community. But also, collectively, he's talking to the whole church here that we are God's chosen people, 
collectively. It's not just an individual responsibility or an individual calling upon us. There is a collective calling upon us. That's why we're called in to community. Peter uh, says this in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a critical ingredient for effective community that we need to understand that we are called and chosen individually and collectively. You see, physical distancing cannot change our identity. We are called to be one in Christ. The second ingredient, Paul says, uh, is that we have to have Christ-like character. He says we're to clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. I love the description here where he says you have to clothe yourselves because if you're anything like me, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience they don't come naturally to me, particularly someone like patience. <laughs> I'm a naturally impatient person. Even compassion, I think many of us st suffer from compassion fatigue. There's so much need in the world that sometimes we feel our reservoir of compassion has gone empty. And Paul is a realist here. He says that these things don't come naturally to us. So he says we have to clothe ourselves. It's a decision that we need to take every day to clothe ourselves with Christ-like character, to put on Christ and say that actually it's him we're going to represent uh, in this world. And particularly in our community with one another, sometimes it can be tough being in Christian community. We can annoy and irritate one another. So we need to clothe ourselves with these characteristics of Christ so that we can build one another up and we can, can, and we can represent him effectively. Elsewhere, Paul talks about these as the fruits of the Spirit. He says in Galatians 5 verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You see, effective community is impossible if we do not live by the Spirit. And maybe this is also what it means. This is why day, morning prayers and devotions can be so important for us before we go into community with one another. Because it gives us that opportunity to, to firstly become clothed with Christ but also to allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. You see, without the Spirit of Christ, we will constantly make a mess of our community and it will become ineffective community. We need the ingredient to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to clothe ourselves on a daily basis, to make the decision to have the character of Christ. And in times like these, we need Christian community that flows out of the character of Christ that represents the character of Christ to the world. So that's our second ingredient, to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we have Christ-like character. Paul then goes on to say even more in terms of our relationships with one another. We need to be quick to forgive. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We have a, a, a saying in our, in our family that, that we constantly play the blame game. I don't know what it's like in your family. There's lots of board games we like to play. We enjoy playing board games. We enjoy our family time. But you know what happens when something goes wrong in our family? Then we play the blame game. If someone smashes a glass on the floor, it's, well, it's not their fault. It's because someone left it in an inconvenient place. Uh, if something goes wrong, rather than taking self-responsibility, uh, we're always looking to blame someone else. But actually, uh, when we talked about Christ-like character, one of the characteristics of Christ uh, that we need to follow is we need to be quick to forgive. But one of the things that will help us be quick to forgive is if we practice the discipline of confession. Uh, rather than playing the blame game, we need to learn in effective community to take responsibility for our actions. James uh, in chapter 5 verse 16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this, 
The community of the saints is not an ideal community consisting of perfect and sinless men and women where there is no need of further repentance. No, it is a community which proves that it is worthy of the gospel of forgiveness by constantly and sincerely proclaiming God's forgiveness. It is a community of men and women who have genuinely encountered the previous grace of God and who walk worthily of the gospel by not casting that grace recklessly away. You see, if we don't forgive other people, it's like we're casting away the grace that we have received from Christ ourselves. Because we have been forgiven much in Christ, so we also need to forgive others. But in order to make forgiveness easily within the, easy within the community of, of Christ, we also need to confess our sins uh, to one another. Something we've talked about in the message family over the past uh, while is that we have a lot of people coming out of prison, but we also have people who've been mature Christians for a long time. Uh, and, and actually we find that in our community there's a level playing field. We all still mess up. We all still make mistakes. And so we've been trying to define, well, what does it mean to really become holy? And, and holiness, I think, is not some kind of esoterical state <laughs> um, that, that we're trying to achieve. Rather, holiness is, is a practical day-by-day -day confession of our sins. So what we've, what we've been saying is that this, the definition of holiness is that we decrease the time between when we mess up and when we own up. That we allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be on our lives so that, so that when we make a mistake, we're quick to own up. We're quick to ask for forgiveness. And then those around us are quick to forgive. You see, when, the power, when, when, when we sp actually speak about our sin, the power of it over our lives is broken. That's the power of confession. So if we want to have effective community, we need to be quick to forgive. And a key ingredient of that is that we confess our sins to one another so that we can forgive one another. Paul then says the fourth ingredient, he says, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I love that. Put, put on love. Love is the bond of unity. The bond is the glue. Love is the glue that is going to help us stick together together. Through it all, even through the hard times, love is the thing that's going to hold us together. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives us a beautiful description of what love is. And one of the most challenging things he says there in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 is love keeps no record of wrongs. And this is so important in a community like a church that, that walks together through life over long periods of time. Just like in a marriage, to make it work, you cannot keep a record of wrongs. You cannot store the wrongs away in a cupboard to be brought out at an appropriate time when you've got a strong point to make or when you want to, to prove yourself the more, the more superior. And in a, in a church, we cannot keep a record of wrongs. We need to be able to forgive one another. A story I read uh, recently uh, it goes like this, Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, was reminded one day of a vicious deed that someone had done to her years before. But she acted as if she had never even heard of the incident. Don't you remember it? Her friend asked. No, came Barton's reply. I distinctly remember forgetting it. I distinctly remember forgetting it. This is what love does. It forgets the wrongs. It forgives and it forgets. It's the glue that can hold us together. But it is a choice. It's a choice that we have to make. Paul says love binds us in perfect unity. And actually, if we look at the words of Jesus, that the church, Christian community, should be defined by love. John 13 verse 35, he said, This is how the world will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. And in these days, I think love for one another is an amazing missional opportunity. At a time when the world is feeling distanced and isolated, when unbelievers are looking for answers, are they going to find unconditional love in the church? Are they going to find the love of Christ in our hearts? Are they going to be attracted to us because they see the reality of Jesus' love? So the key ingredient we need to stick to love. Love needs to be the glue that holds us together. 
He then goes on in verse 15 to say, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. You are called to peace. We must to submit to peace. Peace must rule our hearts. If we want effective community, we need to follow the words of Christ who said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. As with all the ingredients we're talking about, to have effective community, peace doesn't happen by chance. Peace takes effort. Peace is not a passive word that, that comes through inactivity. It's not a withdrawal uh, uh, from even from conflict. Rather, it's engaging in conflict in a biblical way. It's not the absence of sometimes things that frustrate us and tension, but it's willing to deal with those things in a godly way that seeks a peaceful outcome to maintain unity. Effective community comes when we are committed to living at peace with one another. A challenge for each one of us is this. Are you a peacemaker? Are you someone committed to peace? We need to be peacemakers. That's a key ingredient for effective community. And then he says in just a few words, he says three words, powerful words, the next ingredient. And be thankful. And be thankful. We need to be continually thankful. We need to have a perspective of gratitude. You know, and this gratitude needs to be like the perspective that is like spectacles that we put on uh, that helps us perceive the world differently. In these days, it's so easily to become undone by negativity. When we're bombarded with the news, when we're bombarded with social media, when we sometimes look around and feel so desperate, it can, it can make us feel really down and, and depressed even. How do we lift ourselves from that place? Well, all, as we read the Psalms, we learn that so often we lift ourselves out of that place by looking to the Lord and being thankful and being grateful. There is always something in Jesus that we can be thankful for. Are you viewing the world with critical eyes? Is your perspective through glasses, through spectacles of discontent? Or are you viewing the world with gratitude and thankfulness? Because there are millions of miracles that God is undertaking on our behalf on a daily basis. And there's gratitude. We, in, we need to find things to be grateful for, even in the community that we're within how we can still be grateful that we can meet together, even if it's virtually. How we can be grateful that people are praying for us and standing with us. How we can be grateful for the, for the homes that we have um, and the provision that we have for, for meals and daily bread. There's always something to be grateful for. If we, if we have a heart of gratitude, it helps us to build one another up in Jesus. Pete Gregg, the author, wrote this. But if you learn to pray about things like nice looking trees or your daily bread when the supermarket is full of the stuff, then you will learn in a state of, uh, sorry, then you will live in a state of continual gratitude for miracles so common that most people take them for granted. Your relationship with God is at, is at its best when you talk to him about trivia. <laughs> An attitude of gratitude grows from a daily conversation with him. Ask God to give you a heart of gratitude, to be grateful, to be thankful. It, it changes our perspective and enables us to build effective community. And the seventh and final one that Paul gives us here is an ingredient for effective community. He says this, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. If we want to be an effective community at this time, we need to be full of the word. In fact, maybe there's never been a better time for us to become saturated in the word of God. We need to feast on the word. And this must be what informs everything we do. It must inform how we view our relationships with one another, how we view our relationship with the world, how we view our perspective on coronavirus and all the events of this time, how we view the economy, how we view our government. Everything should be informed through reflecting uh, on, on the word 
um, of God. You see, our, I believe this, our community experience, the depth of our community will be di directly proportional to our feasting on the word. The word of Christ must dwell richly among you. We must, be, we must be admonishing one another in the word, teaching one another in the word, allowing the word to shape our thinking, reminding one another of the promises of God and holding the word of God highly in our esteem, most highly because this is the word that reveals Jesus to us. For an effective community, we need to be full of the word. We need to be word-centered as the word reveals Jesus to us and teaches us about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit will equip us for every good work. So the seventh ingredient then, be saturated in the word. I just read it already, but Colossians 3 verse 17, it's like a summary statement. He says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This beautiful summary statement makes it clear that when we're building effective community, when we're living in this way, it's being done as an offering to God. It's something pleasing to him. So as we commit to these ingredients of effective community, I pray they will help us bring glory to God. Just a reminder of the seven ingredients. Firstly, we said we need to have our identity understand our individual and corporate identity in Christ that we need to have the character of Christ secondly as the fruits of the spirit uh, that we clothe ourselves with every day that we need to commit to forgiving one another's sins as Christ has forgiven us this is the third ingredient and that that is spurred on through confession to one another that the, the fourth ingredient was that love is the glue, the glue that will bind us together. We saw fifthly um, that we need to be committed to being peacemakers. And then we saw we need to have the perspective of gratitude, that the sixth ingredient is to put on the spectacles of gratitude through which we view the, wor the world. And finally, we said we need to be full of the world full of the word, that our uh, effective community would be directly proportional to our feasting on the word. This is a new era. Everyone is saying it's unprecedented times. But actually, in this new era, we need to return to the gospel imperative that we are called to be the community of Christ. And we are called to represent his love to a hurting and broken world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your church. We thank you, Jesus, that you placed us in a family, that we are all your children, Father God. And we thank you that in this family we can learn to live in a way that spurs one another on towards love and good deeds. I pray for East Claremont Congregational Church that at this time they will continue to commit to being an effective community. I pray that they will know your love and your grace and your goodness day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, God bless you and stay safe.